Well, I have studied many conspiracy theories in my life, and the absolute worst one I've ever heard is the official version of 9-11. We were told that 19 Muslim fanatics somehow bypassed our $40 billion defense system, hijacked four planes simultaneously, causing their transponders to go off almost at the exact same time, were totally lost from uh, FAA radar, not to mention satellite radar and NORAD radar, made their way to New York and crashed into two prominent landmarks, the two towers of the World Trade Center, and then another one crashed into the Pentagon, and then another one crashed in Pennsylvania, and all of this under the direction of a Muslim cleric hiding in a cave in Afghanistan with a computer. Now, if I didn't about the craziest conspiracy theory I ever heard, <clears throat> and yet that is what we are expected to accept as the legitimate version of what happened on 9-11. But as anyone who studied the facts knows, there's too many gaps in that whole story. Um, the evidence points to something much larger than that. First, we start with war game exercises, vigilant warrior, vigilant guardian. For more than a year, no one even knew that these war game exercises were being conducted on the morning of 9-11. And when it began to circulate on the internet, the response seemed to be, this is some sort of internet hoax. And yet, when Richard Clark, who was then the counterterrorism chief, published his book, he within six pages, talked about the war games exercises. He contacted uh, General Myers of NORAD and said, we have planes hijacked. Do you have interceptors in the air? And the first thing Myers said was, well, is this real or is this the war games? The FAA had as many as 22 images on their radar screens that were false software images <clears throat> simulating hijacked planes. Our normal interceptors had training ammunition and we're off into Canada, off over the Atlantic, here, there, and everywhere. And it was because of these war game exercises that the hijackers were able to penetrate our normal defense system and cause the havoc that they did on 9-11. And yet there's been very little or no mention of this. Why? Because the National Security Agency uh, intercepted a, a, a message from Mohammed Atta, who we are told was the leader of the hijacks, the day before, in which he said, the match is about to begin, tomorrow is zero hour. Notice he didn't say the jihad or the operation or the attack, he said the match. The games begin tomorrow, and that's zero hour. Now, if the public in the United States had no idea of these war games, how did the hijackers know to coordinate their attacks with these war game exercises. And there's only one explanation. This was an inside job. They had inside information. And then it just goes on and on from there. Uh, the collapse of the World Trade Center was one of the biggest disasters in world history. More firemen were killed than in any other one event. Uh, this was the first and only instances of modern skyscrapers that just completely collapsed upon themselves. Uh, it was the largest structural failure in history. And yet, where was the investigation? They should have had everyone from building contractors and, and structural engineers and metallurgists and everything else. They should have poured over that evidence for months and months and even years to find out what really happened to make sure it would never happen again. But this didn't happen. In fact, who investigated it? Was it the New York Fire Department or the New York Police Department? No. Was it the FBI? No. It was FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Administration, which answers directly to the President of the United States. Okay? And what did they do? They employed 26 engineers and then would not even let them look at all the evidence or look at all the buildings involved. And they had to give out a pretty tepid report. Then they took the steel, which should have been studied from hell to breakfast to find out how that could have collapsed, even under intense fires, and it was all shipped overseas. Blatant destruction of evidence. But at the key of that, of the World Trade Center, lies not the Twin Towers. There's been too much, you know, hired experts on every side 
claiming this, that, and the other thing. What you have to look at is Building 7. Building 7 was nestled between the Verizon Building, the U.S. Post Office, across the street from the World Trade Center complex, and between Building 5 and 6 was between Building 7 and the Twin Towers. And this was a 47-story steel and concrete structure. And at about 5.20 on the afternoon of September the 11th, no planes hit this building, but it caved in on itself and totally collapsed into its own footprint. So perfectly that it did very little damage to the Verizon building or the U.S. Post Office. Larry Silverstein, the uh, leaseor of the World Trade Center, said on public television, that he didn't want any more loss of life. He was afraid that there could be a problem. So he told them to pull it. And he stood there while they pulled it. Pulling it is an industry jargon for a controlled demolition. And that's exactly what happened to Building 7. The commander of the New York Fire Department in talking about Buildings 5 and 6 that were so heavily damaged said we had to pull them. And they just blew down those buildings too. Well, if Building 7 was the result of a controlled demolition, then I think that there's every reason in the world to ask the question, was the towers the result of controlled ex demolition? The thing that really concerns me, having covered many controlled building demolitions, is that when they blow a building down, there is still huge chunks of concrete everywhere, and they have to go in and break all that up. In the World Trade Center, it was pulverized. Nothing but dust and debris everywhere. Something with tremendous pressure was able to pulverize the concrete in those buildings. And you don't have that by a building suddenly toppling down. And I would point you simply to the Windsor Hotel in Madrid, Spain, which in early 2005 burned out of control through a whole weekend for three or four days, <clears throat> completely gutted the building had temperatures in excess of a thousand degrees, building never collapsed. So there are serious questions that were never addressed by the hand-picked 9-11 Commission. People, witnesses have been silenced. Uh, the people that I would particularly point to are the maintenance engineers for the North and South Tower who are on the public record saying that there were multiple explosions in the buildings and explosions underground. Mike Pecoraro, uh, was in a six-floor sub-basement when the building shook. He and a worker went to the third sub-basement, which was a machine shop, and he said it was destroyed. He said, I'm talking about a 50-ton drill press, just gone. And this was before the building collapsed. What caused the destruction in the basements of the World Trade Center before those buildings collapsed? Nobody's addressed that question. And of course, there's so many questions about the Pentagon that it's not even funny. That we are told that a big Boeing 757 smacked into the Pentagon, folded up like a tube and just roared in there and then caught fire and burned up with such intensity that there's no wreckage left. And yet I interviewed a survivor, April Gallup, who along with her small child crawled through the hole in the west side of the Pentagon. There's no way she'd be alive today if there were that kind of fires going on and that kind of heat. And the key thing here is we all know that after every major air disaster, they reconstruct the aircraft. They take every little piece they can find and they go to a hangar and they reassemble it so they can figure out what happened to that aircraft. Show me a picture of the 757 pieced back together from the Pentagon and I'll shut up about the questions about the Pentagon, but they haven't showed us that and they won't. There's too many unanswered questions. This is a tremendous cover-up that's taken place. And if we are going to continue to call ourselves a free people, we better start demanding some truthful answers. I think we all know that uh, Prescott Bush, the patriarch of the Bush family, and that uh, George Herbert Walker Bush and George W. Bush are all members of the Skull and Bones. Now, there are some who argue that the Skull and Bones is the secret society behind the secret societies and that they run everything. I'm not convinced of that. There are plenty of people who have been inducted into the Skull and Bones and who have elected not to follow through on all their contacts and have gone on to live very respectable and and good lives, okay? 
The skull and bones, however, is a springboard. That's where they take young men, they find the ones that, with ability, and more importantly, those that are compliant, and they groom them to become world leaders. And all you have to do is just go study about the skull and bones, and you'll find that there is an inordinate number of people who go on to take top government positions. Again, if this was really a free country, you'd think that we'd have some people from, you know, Southern Cal, University of Texas, Oklahoma, somebody. You know, there's got to be some smart people around somewhere. But these folks are always the ones that end up in power. Also, it has been established that the Skull and Bones is actually the Order 322. It is the 322nd chapter of the Illuminati. This was published in the New York Times. Now we get to the question of how come you don't know all this, and that gets back to the control of the media. First, you have to understand the media cannot control every, I mean, these people, these secret societies cannot control all the editors and all the reporters across the country. No, they control the media through the distribution of the information. Just in the past several months, there have been some massive anti-war demonstrations taking place in California, in Denver, in Washington. And most of you have heard little or nothing about them. And when you did hear about them, oh, 30,000 people, uh-uh, try 500,000. There have been massive demonstrations in England and in Germany, and you very rarely hear about that. This is because they control not the editors and publishers, but the distribution of the information. And how do they do that? I've listed two here, Time Warner and Disney. There's another couple that I could mention. Uh, Viacom is another one. Vaventi is another one. Clear Channel is now buying up all of the radio stations in this country. Clear Channel bought up Premier Radio not long back, and now two of its leading voices, Whitley Strieber and Art Bell, are no longer with us. Okay? And who owns Clear Channel? Well, it's connected to the Carlisle Group. That's Henry Kissinger and the Bush family. Okay? So they are clamping down on the access to information. And never lose sight of the fact is I don't care how brilliant you are, if you make decisions based on faulty, erroneous, or incomplete information, you're not going to be making the right decision. At the top is a note that was written to James Tucker, who uh, used to write for the old Spotlight, now writes for the American Free Press, and he has tracked the Bilderbergers for years. And uh, this lady that was an ombudsman with the Washington Post sends him a note and says, well, if observations of the Bilderberg, the Trilateral Commission, Council on Foreign Relations, Aspen Institute, etc., hold true, there's much that is ponderous, but little that is newsworthy. How is that for a condescending, unthinking response? Let me put it this way. What do you think the news media's reaction would be if all of the owners of the National Football League franchises were to meet in a big hotel secretly with armed guards all around it, won't let the media in, won't let anybody in, they meet there for about a week, and then they all come out and say, sorry, I can't tell you what we talked about. Would they blow their lid or what? They'd be yelling price fixing, collusion, restraint of trade, you know, blah, they raise hell. But you get the leaders of commerce and banking and industry, and they meet once a year, and they hide themselves off in some big, well-guarded resort, and they come out and say, we're not going to tell you what we talked about. It makes a mockery of freedom of the press. It makes a mockery of freedom, period. We have got to start understanding who's really calling the shots, because until we understand what's really going on, how can we make any decisions or do anything about what's happening in our own country? I had to throw in this cartoon it says, well, the CBS Viacom deal, look at what you get. Movies, MTV, radio, videos, Nickelodeon, news media, theme parks, billboards, showtime, just about every kind of entertainment and advertising you could want. The guy says, well, what about the news? This is the news. This is the news. Think about it, folks. Not long back, I'm sitting at home, and I don't watch TV that much, but I happen to have it on. They said, that we're going to interrupt for a news news break. I'm going, okay, good. I'll catch the headline news. Got to get caught up. 
There were four stories that they put out over this two-minute news break or whatever it is, and all four of them were sports stories. So-and-so won the Masters, you know, so-and-so won some football game, some baseball game. Don't get me wrong. I love sports. But sports are sports. They are not news. You can get all excited about the big game, but then next week it's over with, and who cares? And what does it really matter? It doesn't. And that's what's masquerading, though, as news. Now, these folks, it's already been said right here at this conference that these folks are really the big, brightest and the best, and they are more intelligent than we are. And it's only right and proper that they run everything because they only have our best interest at heart. Well, let's look back over just the past hundred years. They've given us two world wars, two depressions, one acknowledged and the one currently not. <laughs> and it doesn't sound like they're operating in our best interest. Not at all. They give us the Persian Gulf War. That was Daddy Bush's war. Drew his line in the sand. Just happened to be north of the, the Harkin Energy Holdings of, the, of his son, George W., who just by sheer coincidence, I'm sure, sold off the bulk of those holdings right before the invasion of Kuwait and made himself a, almost a cool million dollars by selling short on that. Think You think Daddy might have whispered in his ear? Oh, no, I wouldn't do that, would they? Of course they would. And then the whole thing ends, just as everything's closing in. Got too much to cover here. I could give you the whole story. When the American ambassador goes to Saddam Hussein, April Glassby, and she testified to this in front of Congress, but didn't go anywhere. He says, uh, we're going to go back to our original boundaries, which means he's going to take back Kuwait, which was illegally taken and carved out of uh, Iraq in the first place by the British years ago, so they could uh, get their hands on some of those southern Iraqi oil reserves. And uh, he asked the American ambassador, you know, what do, what do you all think about that? And her almost exact answer was, well, uh, I've been instructed to inform you that we consider that an Arab problem, and we don't really have any thoughts on that. What does that sound like? Sounds like do what you want to do. And then the minute he sends his troops into Kuwait, oh, he's the new Hitler. All right? And the Saudis put up a $12 billion war chest hidden in a secret account in, in London for George Bush to use to prosecute the Persian Gulf War. It's a deal, folks. It's just a deal. They're all just deals. This whole thing right now, I'll tell you what I suspect. We all know this thing for about Iraq is about oil. But why do we need the oil? we got plenty of oil in the United States, and we're not getting that much out of the Middle East anyway. And besides that, we now have our troops in Afghanistan, which means we now control the Caspian Sea oil reserves, something that's been a big bone of contention for the last hundred years, ever since the Nobel brothers went over there and started uh, uh, production in the Caspian Sea area. When Hitler sent his sixth army charging through the Ukraine, they weren't going to capture Stalingrad. They were trying to get to those Caspian Sea oil reserves, but they got stopped at Stalingrad. It's been a big bone of contention. Everybody wants to get a hold of Caspian Sea oil. Well, now we have it. And Britain now wants their share. They want the Iraqi oil. And it's really funny because we see Tony Blair uh, standing up, and he's pushing for war with Iraq just about as hard as uh, George Bush. And we think, oh, our wonderful British allies, boy, they're with us through thick and thin. I think once you study these secret societies and where they came from and who's really behind all this, it's the other way around. BP wants the oil, but they can't move British troops into Iraq because, quite correctly, that would be perceived as aggression. But the United States has already fought a war with Iraq, so we can go in and take it for them. Y'all just hide and watch. We have a war and we have a regime change and we get gain control over Iraq. You hide and watch if British Petroleum doesn't get a big chunk of that. It's all about oil. We all know that. And the problem is we're all so fat and sassy. We well yeah, but I gotta have gas for my car, man. I gotta drive down to the seven eleven and get a pack of cigarettes, you know. I mean, yeah, it's only a block away, but who wants to walk a block? You know. We are just really so, we just have no idea of uh, the misery in most of the world because we all have it so well. I mean, you know.
So it's all about oil, and my big complaint there is, is we don't need the damn oil, okay? We don't need to be on a petroleum energy basis anyway. There's so much other things we could be doing. Uh, do you realize that with just some tweaking of the intake uh, jets in your carburetor, you could be running your car on hydrogen? And hydrogen does not cause any pollution. And hydrogen is the most plentiful substance on the planet. Think about it. This is a water planet. H2O, two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. We could be burning hydrogen. We don't even need the damn oil. But no, we're going to go over there and kill a whole bunch of people and probably our own troops. And look what's happening with the Gulf veterans right now. They're all coming down with all kinds of sicknesses, probably because of the contaminated vaccines they got. Also, the depleted uranium shells that were lying everywhere, giving them a radiation dose that destroys their immunization system, not to mention the, the oily smoke and petrochemicals hanging in the air. And do you think that a new war with Iraq is going to be any better? Never mind the massive casualties that Iraq's going to suffer. Wait till our guys come back and we have another 20 years and they'll be raising hell about their, their health problems. And uh, what's the government going to do about it? I'll tell you right now, not a damn thing. Let me tell you something. When I was in the Army, this just really gets my blood to boiling when I think about this. When I was in the Army back during Vietnam, we'd get sea rations. And in the sea rations, along with the powdered milk and the, this and the other thing, was a little packet of cigarettes. You five little cigarettes. We always thought that was cool, free cigarettes. And those who didn't smoke would swap them around to those who did, and they, it was almost a medium of exchange. And that practice goes way on back even through World War II. Where do you think all those guys in World War II got the smoking habits? Because the Army gave them free cigarettes. And now under the Clinton administration, when some of these guys who put their life on the line to fight for freedom and democracy in World War II, and they start coming down with emphysema and lung cancer, and they go to the VA under the Clinton administration. They ruled that that was a self-inflicted disease and that they would not treat the veterans. That's shameful, folks. That's shameful. You give your soldiers cigarettes all through their career, and then you won't treat them when they get a health-related problem? Unconscionable. But that's what happens when you let these secret society creeps run your country. Going back past the Gulf War, and now we get back to Vietnam, and uh, Lyndon Johnson and his wise men, okay? He surrounded himself with about 12, 14 guys, and they were every one of them counsel on foreign relations. In fact, Vietnam, the thing I never could quite figure out is why were we fighting 9,000 miles away from the shores of the United States? Well, let me tell you why. Because right after World War II, the Council on Foreign Relations published some papers that were saying we needed to gain control over the mineral resources of Southeast Asia which at that time was called French Indochina. All right, but then in the spring of 1954, the French got defeated at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, and they withdrew from French Indochina. Within weeks, John Foster Dulles, a founder of the Council on Foreign Relations, and who was then Secretary of State to Dwight Eisenhower, goes to the Philippines and creates something called the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization, CETO. And he later explained that he did that to give the American president the legal precedent for intervention in South in Southeast Asia. That was the beginning of the whole thing. Now, is he acting on the best interest of the United States, or is he acting on the best interest of the Council on Foreign Relations that wanted control over those mineral resources? And, of course, I don't have to tell you what happened. 58,000 American lives later, we finally slunk away with our tail between our legs, defeated by a bunch of guys. And, in rubber sandals, thanks to the wise men. And in the middle of this, when our guys are dying in the jungles of Vietnam, who's over in Russia but David Rockefeller meeting with Khrushchev? And, on the exist and, and with the insistence of David Rockefeller and his other powerful friends of the Council on Foreign Relations, they encouraged Lyndon Johnson to increase loans to Russia at levels higher than we did in World War II when they were our allies against Hitler. Now, what does this mean? It means, folks, that while our sons and daughters and brothers and husbands were over there fighting for their lives in the jungles of Vietnam, we were told we had to do that because North Vietnam was a surrogate of China and Russia 
and that if we didn't stop them there, then it's the domino effect, and they'd take over the Philippines, and they'd take over Hawaii, and they'd take over this country, and we had to stop them right there. And that they were getting arms and ammunition from China and Russia, and it was an anti-communist crusade. And to that extent, it was true. They were getting arms and ammunition and war materials from China and Russia. And Russia was getting loans from us. And they'd take our tax-supported money, and they'd build facilities like the Kama River Truck Factory, and they'd crank out war materials to ship to North Vietnam to use against our guys. Does that make any sense to anybody? But that's what goes on, folks, and it's still going on. And unless we start waking up, it's going to continue. If you stop and think about it, gunfire is pretty well decided every national election from 1964 to 1988. 64, Lyndon Johnson wins on the sympathy because of the JFK assassination. 68, Nixon wins after uh, uh, the uh, reaction to the Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy shootings. Then in 1972, uh, George Wallace looks like he's going to pull votes from Nixon and he's shot. 1976, Carter uh, uh, wins after there were assassination attempts on Gerald Ford. And then in 1980, Reagan is elected after an assassination attempt on Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter? You don't remember the assassination attempt on Jimmy Carter? Why, well, he had asked for national TV time in the late spring of 1979, and he was going to announce some sweeping changes in government, including curtailing the CIA. But then he goes to Los Angeles, and he's attacked by Raymond Lee Harvey and Oswaldo Ortiz. So Lee Harvey and Oswaldo were going to kill him in Los Angeles. There it is. You saw it in the Newsweek article. But you don't remember that, do you? Because it didn't get distributed in the news media. And right after that, he canceled his national TV talk, went to seclusion at Camp David, called in everybody up to and including Billy Graham, and said, I've lost control of the government. And he was out. And Reagan was in. And two months after Reagan was elected, he shot. And if that bullet had been that much closer, it had hit his heart, and we would have had George Bush eight years earlier. People don't think about that, do they? Oh, well, I just I guess that's a conspiracy theory. Speaking of, you're going to love this one, the Reagan shooting. All network tapes, clearly, you can clearly hear the sound of seven shots. Bam, 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 bam. Hinkley had a six-shot revolver. How do you get seven shots out of a six-shot revolver? And where did it come from? Up there, circling red? The bullet that struck Reagan was in a downward trajectory. Go back and check the media. They, they accurately reported that. And Hinckley, though, is standing level with him over here in the crowd, back over here beyond that policeman. Up here is a sliding glass door with a human figure crouched behind that door. Was this the person who actually shot Reagan? We don't know because there's never any investigations because all that's just conspiracy theory. But, of course, Reagan was shot, and for months, the person who was really in charge was George Herbert Walker Bush. You're going back to Korea. You find out that Russian generals were running the Korean War on both sides. Does that make any sense? And yet the bulk of the Allied troops was our guys, the United States military, supported by our tax dollars. We're really being taken, folks. Go all the way back to World War II. Again, I, I noticed it was mentioned here at this conference that, well, uh, everything would have been okay except Hitler was the bad guy, and he, he kind of screwed everything up. Well, let me tell you, folks, do your homework. Hitler didn't just suddenly appear. Hitler, number one, was a military intelligence agent who was assigned to infiltrate the Nazi party. And he went back to his superiors and said, well, there's a, went to this meeting, there's only about nine guys there, but you'd like them because they want to rebuild Germany and they hate the Jews and they want to they rearm and they want to repudiate the Versailles Treaty. So his superior said, ah, that sounds pretty good. Here's some money. Go back and help out. So they created Hitler. And then as he began to gain more power, who was behind him? 
another secret society, the Thule Gesellschaft, or the Thule Society, made up of some of the leading industrialists, leading intellectuals in Germany at the time. People, and also people who had an intimate working knowledge of the occult. All right? So now we can see that all of these secret societies have been working along. And it was the same thing back during World War One. Same people ran World War One. It's amazing, but uh, but uh, at the time of the Russian Revolution, where was Lenin? He wasn't in Russia. He was in Switzerland. Where was uh, Leon Trotsky, the, the communist key philosopher? He wasn't in Russia. He was in New York City working for Wall Street capitalists. And they gave him money, and they gave him uh, all kinds of support to go into Russia and take over a popular uprising and change it into a communist government. Lenin was the same thing. We all know that he was put on a sealed railroad car and traveled through wartime Germany that was at war with Russia and was sent on into Russia to take over the government and set up the communist system. And one of the people who helped facilitate that was a leading banker in Germany who also was very highly connected with German intelligence, and that was a fellow by the name of Max Warburg. Now, don't you find it passing strange that in World War I, Max Warburg, who was head of German intelligence and a big leading banker there in Germany, his brother, Paul Warburg, founded the Federal Reserve System in our country and at that time was head of the of the financial end of World War One for the United States of America. Does nobody find that amazing? Here he is, Paul Warburg. And and here's the house on Jekyll Island where the plans were laid to instill upon us the Federal Reserve System which is neither federal nor has any reserve. All right? It is a system of 12 banks. <laughs> it's a system of 12 banks that are in turn owned by other private banks. And in fact, most of the studies that have been done show that the majority of ownership in the banks that control the Federal Reserve are held by people who are not even Americans. Think about that one. I could get into money and the whole thing, but let's keep going. Here's the original Federal Reserve Board, and there's, my, there's old Paul. He headed up the original Federal Reserve Board. And here we see Woodrow Wilson and Colonel House and his wife. And this is where it begins to tie into the older secret societies, because as I've pointed out, Trilateral Commission connects to the CFR. The intercorp leadership is Bilderberger. The CFR was created right after World War I by Colonel House, Bernard Baruch, and others to try to sell us on the idea of globalization. And these folks had been members of the old uh, Cecil Rhodes uh, secret society called the Round Tables. Here is a cartoon from 1911 showing Karl Marx shaking hands with uh, J.P. Morgan, George Perkins, Teddy Roosevelt, John Ryan of National City Bank, John D. Rockefeller, and Andrew Carnegie. They financed communism. They created it. Why? So they could play both ends against the middle. Think of Cold War. And now it's over with. And think of the billions of dollars that were squandered on that Cold War. Think of what this country could be today if we'd spent that money building schools and upgrading education, upgrading health facilities. No, 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 that was not going to make them money. So see, back in 1911, those old folks knew better about what was really going on than we do today. And this is just a little graphic showing the New World Order and how that it tracks on down. You can take a look at that. I do want to mention the Hegelian dialectic. That sounds pretty fancy, but basically all it is is just uh, action response and then synthesis, synthesis, whatever you work out. You all do this all the time. You and your wife or husband decide you want to go to the movies. One of you says you want to go see movie A. The other one says, no, I don't want to see that. I want to see movie B. 
Okay? Well, the one who wants to see movie A, that's thesis. That's his thesis or her thesis. One says, I want to see movie B, that's antithesis or antithesis, the antithesis. Okay? Now, then you work it out. If you're like me and my wife, what we usually do is end up going seeing movie C, <laughs> which is second choice for both of us, but it's one we can agree on. That is synthesis. And that's how it works. And, and all Hegel did was simply kind of work out this formula for human interaction. But where the secret society folks took a leg up on it is, is they figured out you don't have to wait for a problem and then offer it a solution and then how it works out is what you get. You create a problem. You create a problem. Then you offer the solution and then whatever's worked out, you got it. When the Murrah Federal Building was bombed, they had anti-terrorist legislation pending in Congress. And some of it was pretty draconian. They, it was going to just shred the Constitution. And most people were going, wait a minute, I, I don't know, I don't know. They weren't going for it. And it was hung up. It wasn't going anywhere. Boom, federal building in Oklahoma blows up. I'm not going to go into that, but most of you know there's a whole lot more there than Timothy McVeigh and his little fertilizer bomb, OK? But boom, it goes up. All right, now you got a problem. And what's the solution? Got to pass all this anti-terrorism legislation. So then, but then that's a problem. So what's the solution? Well, you, you work on it, you water it down, and it, it still got passed. Not to the extent they originally wanted, but it got passed. And it's the same thing that we knew the communists did for years. Two steps forward, one step back. Two steps forward, one step back. This stuff they've rammed through over the past year, Homeland Security, Patriot Act. You hide and watch as the years draw on, unless, unless they pump us up again with some other terrorist act, which they're liable to if we start balking at everything. But courts will begin to throw some of that stuff out, and the thing will start coming back into balance. Already there are 60 cities in the United States that have passed ordinances that uh, are ordering their local police and, and the law enforcement people not, not to enforce Homeland Security and Patriot Act provisions because they're unconstitutional. Of course, you don't hear much about that through the mass control corporate media, but it's happening. And there will be a backlash. It will come, and things will balance out a little bit. But see, it's already on the books. And, what, and this Homeland Security thing, once you create that whole level of bureaucracy, I guarantee it will never go away. The CIA is a good example. That was intended to be exactly what it says, the Central Intelligence Agency. It was going to be a small agency that was going to take the intelligence from the Army and the Air Force and the Navy and everybody else and, and coordinate it. And it was, it was intended to stop uh, duplication of effort. And instead, it created a whole monster that we're still having to deal with. Okay? And it'll never go away. Homeland Security will never go away. We should never have passed it in the first place, but. There was no debate, no talk. They got Homeland Security the night they got, they, it started off, it was a 30-page thesis saying, here's what we probably need to do. And by the time it got to Congress, it was 500 pages, and they got it the night before the vote. Now, folks, I don't care how smart you are, you can't read 500 pages, absorb it, think about it, and make an intelligent decision. And I'll tell you, for that one fact alone, and I'm not even going to argue the merits of Homeland Security, but for the mere fact that your representatives passed a law that they hadn't even read, I think should be cause enough for a recall. You ought to throw every one of them out. Because what's the first thing a lawyer will tell you? Never sign anything until you've read it. And these guys passed the Patriot Act and the Homeland Security, and they didn't even read it. They had no idea what they were passing. Does any of you all remember back about 1997 or 1998, there was a little furor that got going over something called a, a, a banking program called Know Your Customer. Anybody remember that? Yeah, yeah. And the whole idea was is that your bank was going to have to turn around and be a snitch to the federal government. If you were to, if your deposits somehow were a little bit different than the, 
the normal or if you withdrew an inordinate amount of money or whatever, they were going to report you, be required to report you. And they were going to keep massive personal information files, okay? Your wife, your family, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, but that kind of got public and everybody went, wait a minute, wait a minute, we're not going to put up with that. And sure enough, they kind of backed off and we all thought, we all felt real good, right, that they didn't get that through. It's in Homeland Security. It's in there. It's happening. And you never got to vote on it, did you? You can go all the way back to the war between the states, or where I come from, we call it the War of Northern Aggression. But it was a deal. It was all a deal. August Belmont, a registered agent of the Rothschild banking family in Europe, came to this country and quickly became the leading seller of bonds for the federal government. He's the one that got the money to prosecute the war between the states. At the same time, he was quietly buying up all the southern bonds. It was a deal. Even Chancellor Bismarck of Germany is on the record as saying that the war in the, in the uh, 1860s in the United States was contrived by the Rothschilds to split the country in half so that they could regain North America for the bankers in France and Britain. And if you'll stop and think about it, where was the bulk of the British Army? It was in Canada. Where was the French Army? Anybody? Mexico, under Maximilian. So they were going to let the North and South bleed each other dry, and then they were going to move in. There was only one man who seemed to understand what was going on, and that was the head Yankee, Abraham Lincoln. I'll have to give him some grudging credit. I think he understood what was happening. And that's why he became the first American president to print his own money, known as greenbacks. You know, there's only been one other president in the history of this country that tried to print interest-free money. John F. Kennedy. June 1963, he ordered the issuance of $6 billion in currency, not through the Federal Reserve System, but through the United States Treasury. I have a five dollar note. It says series nineteen sixty three. It's got red ink on it. It says United States note. It doesn't say Federal Reserve note. And I don't think it's a coincidence that both of those presidents were shot in the head. So now we can see what I call my pyramid of power. That's us down at the bottom. <laughs> The poor, long-suffering public. Over us is the low-level political structure. There's your local city council, school board, and stuff. Most of whom are good people trying to do a difficult job. A few snakes in there, but, you know, as we learned in the Army, there's always 2% that won't go along with the program. And your mass media. And this thing may be the disturbing thing most about the mass media having worked in it. It's not that they're bad. It's not that they're liberal. It's not that they're conservative. It's that they're dumb and they're lazy. Okay? They don't want to work. So they will not go out and really pursue a story or look past the superficial explanation. They just take the government handout and they run with it. And this really bothers me because, you know, I think, think about it in our own personal life. Um, if, if you have a good friend and you find that friend is lying to you, then that upsets you. And, but that's a friend, so you try to forgive them and you try to rationalize and think, well, maybe they just didn't understand. Then you, get, then you catch them lying to you again. Well, now it's going, boy, I don't know. Third or fourth time they lie to you, they're no longer your friend, are they? I used to just say, I don't want to have anything to do with that person. He's a liar. Well, the government has got caught lie after lie after lie after lie, and still they come out and say something, and the news media just runs with it as if that's the gospel. And then it takes six months, six years, 40 years for us to find out that it was all a big lie. Then you come on up to your military intelligence agencies and your high-level political structure. Then you come on up to the multinational corporations and the, the, the hub of the New World Order, the United Nations, and it's now military arm, NATO. Okay, And then you come on up through the uh, Council on Foreign Relations, and you notice they're not even at the top of the pyramid, because you get up higher and it even gets higher, and then you get up to the, John Coleman calls the Committee of 300, others call the Illuminati, and then you got a big question mark, because who's telling those people what to do? 
Now we start into real history. I'm not going to really belabor you about Freemasonry other than to tell you that you might want to be aware that the first third party in the United States was the anti-Masonic party. And they broke the back of Masonic Freemason or Freemasonry back in the early 1800s and it never quite recovered until after the Civil War. Within Freemasonry, the uh, this isn't my theory, this is what Masonic historians and writers will tell you if they're honest. There is a huge outer circle. Well, first let me say this, there's a tremendous difference between European Freemasonry and American Freemasonry. The, Nor the European Freemasonry is much more sinister and has much more ties to, uh, to politics and to the Illuminati. But the American, North American Freemasonry is much more of a kind of a fraternal order, and they do great things. Their burn centers are wonderful. But within Freemasonry, on, in both sides of the ocean, there's an outer circle, and then there's a little inner core circle that knows what's really going on and what their agenda really is. Now, don't bother to ask a Masonic friend if that's true, because he will tell you no. And that's because he's either part of the outer circle, in which case he really, truly does not know that there's an inner circle, or he's part of the inner circle, in which case he's taken a blood oath never to reveal that. Okay? But Freemasonry is where a lot of these thoughts, ideals, and knowledge has been passed along, because the men who made up Cecil Rhodes' roundtables, which were the progenitors of the Council on Foreign Relations, Trilateral, etc., were Illuminized Freemasons. They were Freemasons who had been instilled with the knowledge and with the agendas of the Illuminati. And what was that? Where did they think they got all this from? Well, here's Manly Wade Hall, uh, a philosopher, a much studied occultist and, and a very high-ranking mason. And he says, in the Royal Oak Pass, the gods walked with men, and they chose from among the sons of God the wisest and the truest. And these they labored with, preparing them to carry on the work of the gods after the spiritual hierarchies themselves had withdrawn into the invisible worlds. With these specially ordained and illumined sons, they left the keys of their great wisdom. These illumined ones founded what we now know as the ancient mysteries.